What Paul has been teaching us, especially in this third chapter, is he's talking about Christian living. What it's like to live as a Christ follower. What we should do, what we should not do. He's given us a very practical lesson. And literally walks through the things that we should put to death. And things that we should put on as holy and beloved children of God. We see in Colossians 1, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. That's what we just sang about. And that's what Kelsey shared so powerfully, that we can turn our eyes on Him because Jesus has purchased our redemption and we can now come into the holy place with the Father with confidence. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And then he goes on to share in verse 5, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Put it all away. He says, don't be angry or, or wrathful or show malice or slander or have obscene talk. Put it all away. For on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And then he turns a corner and he says, but you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bear with one another, forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Live in harmony together and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and be thankful. And then it's almost like Paul gets to the end of this section and he says, with all that being said, here's a summary. Whatever you do, verse 17, whatever you do, whatever you do, anything that you do, whether it's in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What a beautiful summary for Christian living. I, I'm so grateful that God gives us these summarizing verses to live by and to consider. Whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Surely he knows how simple my mind is. That I need verses like this to be able to remember the, the simplicity of everything you do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. We have a verse here that is applicable to every believer. Every action, every word, every thought, in every place, under every circumstance. This is applicable. It's like the yellow pages. Anybody old enough to remember the yellow pages. Cooper hadn't raised his hand just because, you know, some people, people are looking at me like, are you old enough to remember the yellow pages? Nope, you're not looking at me like that. That's good news. <laughs> the yellow pages is kind of a one-stop shop, right? And for those of you that remember, you, you, you go there to find numbers for people. And that was back in the day when you actually answered the phone when you didn't know who was calling right? Because we didn't have that technology didn't show us that there was an unknown caller calling that was, you know, before caller ID and all that, that somebody found you in the yellow pages because they needed to reach you and you actually answered the phone. The yellow pages was like a one-stop shop, like this, this place where all of these records are kept and you could go there and you could have, you could have every number that you needed. That's Kind of like this verse for us. It's a place where we can go and see under any circumstance, every action, every word, every deed that we act upon can be filtered through the light of this verse. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So first I want to consider what does Paul mean by do everything in the name of Jesus? Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, when you do something in someone else's name, 
you're coming underneath that name as a representative of that name, on behalf of that name. My dad, when I was younger and I was about to leave the house, he would remind me, Jared, you remember you're representing my name when you go out there. And generally, that's when I knew that he knew that I was about to do something that I wasn't supposed to do, you know? <laughs> remember who you represent. Whether you like it or not, you represent me. You bear my name. Whether you say it with your mouth or not, they're going to know. And that's the reality of when you come in the name of someone else, you're coming as a representative on behalf of them, especially in biblical times. They didn't take this lightly. This was a serious thing. When you came in the name of someone else, you were coming in their authority, coming in their power, not your own authority, not your own power, in their power. You were, you were giving them credit and giving them glory. That's what it meant to come in the name of, of someone or something else. Paul often talks of Christians, of us as Christians, as ambassadors for Christ. He called himself an ambassador for Christ, bearing his name, bearing his likeness, his image, carrying his message and his mission to the world living to reflect him as an ambassador of Christ. That's what that means. So to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus is to be an ambassador for him. Not an ambassador for ourselves to get glory for ourselves, an ambassador for Christ to give all the glory and all the praise to him. And the reality for us, the reality for churches is churches will be strongest when they are full of ambassadors rather than heroes and talented individuals with good style and good uh, pre presentation, good preaching, good worship, good music, good lights, good production. Good. If we are known by what we carry and what we carry is his name, that's when we will be powerful. We don't trust in the reputation of man when we come as an ambassador of Christ. We trust in his reputation. There's a big difference there. We don't trust in the prior success of our ministry when we come bearing the name of Jesus. We don't talk about all the things that we've done and how successful we were. We come bearing his name and say, in his name alone will we have more continued fruit in this place. There's a difference. We trust in the name of Jesus, not our own name or our own brand, because we are ambassadors for him. And Paul says, whatever you do in word or in deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I'm going to break this down into four parts today. You could call it four points, but that's dangerous for me when I have a mic. We have, I don't usually have points, but here we go. If you like taking notes, you can call them points. Four parts is how we're gonna break this down today. Number one, do everything under the example of Jesus. Do everything under the example of Jesus. That's what I believe Paul is teaching us. I also believe he's teaching us do everything in the authority of Jesus. Number two. Number three, I believe Paul is teaching us do everything in the power of Jesus. And fourthly, finally, I believe he's teaching us do everything for the glory of Jesus. So first, do everything under the example of Jesus. You remember the WWJD bracelets? Anybody have one on right now? What would Jesus do? I don't see. We had one in the last service. So do you remember them? If you remember them, this is what you do to me. There it is. Okay. It swept a nation. It's this huge, simple little bracelet that swept a nation. What would Jesus do? It's a, it's a great thing to ask. Would we agree? And I didn't know the origins of this uh, bracelet or this company, this movement. And so I looked it up. Does anybody know how it started? There was a man in Kansas who was an author and a, a preacher named Charles Sheldon. 
in the late 1800s, he wrote this book called In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? And he didn't have a great plan for how to release the book, and it actually ended up getting published outside of his rights more and more and more and more and more and sold 30 million copies. Like one of the top 50 most sold books in all of time. And he didn't even really profit off of it. And so then in 1989, there was this girl by the name of Jane Tinklenberg who read the book. She was a youth leader at her small church and she read the book and was captivated. And so she went back to her group and she said, what do you guys think about this this question to guide the way that we live? What would Jesus do? And she started sharing it with her people and she thought it really was kind of catchy. So she made 30 bracelets with WWJD on it with no business plan. It just... 30 bracelets. And the demand started to get pretty high and more people started to catch wind of it. And she, of course, didn't profit from the massive amount of bracelets and shirts and hats and all the things that were sold. But that wasn't the point to her anyway. WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? It's a good question to ask. Charles Spurgeon asked the same question. Charles Spurgeon said this, it is an admirable course for us all to pursue if when we find ourselves in circumstances of perplexity, we ask ourselves the question, what would Jesus Christ have done if he were in my circumstances? The answer to that question is the solution of your difficulty. Whatever he would have done, it will be safe enough for you to do. And whatever he would not have done, it will also be safe enough for you not to do. It is certain that he would not have been unbelieving. Equally certain that he would not have done a wrong thing to deliver himself. We are also sure that he would not have been impatient or rebellious or hopeless. Nor would he have grown wrathful or morose, surely it is good then to learn all my behavior from the same guide. What would Jesus do is a good question to guide the way that we live, but to do everything under his example, we have to begin at the beginning because you must be in Jesus before you can do anything in the name of Jesus. So no matter how many shirts we have with the question, what would Jesus do? And no matter how much effort we put into externally doing what we think Jesus would do, if it doesn't start with a transformed heart, it's going to eventually fade out and the people are going to see the shirt and the bracelets and they're going to call you a phony. Praise God, though, that he's made it possible for us to be transformed from the inside out. And because of that, when we live a life of overflow, we can wear the bracelet as a reminder because we know that our heart has been changed. And this blood-bought heart is so transformed now that I can never return to the place where I was before. But we don't do what Jesus would do in order to attain favor with God because we know that that has already been purchased for us and it's only by grace that we receive that gift. Acts 2, 38 says, repent. This is Peter talking to the crowd. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when you place your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. This is an internal reality that we call regeneration, transformation from the inside out. Old is gone, the new has come. This is being born again. This is the difference in a tree that has no life and a tree that does have life. It's like a a Christmas tree Versus an orange tree or apple tree or any, pick a tree, whatever fruit you like. Name a fruit, somebody. Oh, I heard them all. Peach. We'll go with peach. Peach tree. Doesn't look like Christmas tree, but it works. Christmas tree, 
peach tree. Christmas tree has ornaments on it that we place from the outside and to an untrained eye that may look like fruit. (laughs) To my three-year-old, it looks like fruit because he takes it off and eats it, literally, like depending on what it is when he was younger. Not now. I mean, he's three. Come on. (laughs) Before in August, you know, he's much more mature than that now. To the untrained eye, the Christmas tree looks like it's got some fruit on it, but we actually just put it on from the outside to make it look pretty. But to the peach tree or the orange tree or the apple tree or all the other trees I heard named right there in the moment, the fruit is being produced from the inside. You know what I'm saying? It's it's a matter of where the life source is coming from, and we can't get it twisted and expect life on the outside to be enough for us to grow in the future. We can dress this place up like a Christmas tree, but if there's no source underneath, we're going to be that Christmas tree that's going to wilt and wither away. It's only a matter of time. We can't expect growth from the Christmas tree. It would be foolish. Eventually, the source of life will will reveal itself. That's what Jesus was saying in John chapter 15, verse 5, when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, ready for this, you can do nothing. Jesus didn't mince words. like He didn't kind of be careful around that. He's, no, no, you need to understand this. As clearly as I can put it out there, apart from me, you can do nothing. So it's important what Paul is teaching us. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. He is our source of life. We can't expect a Christmas tree that's been cut off to grow. There is no sap. And we can't expect the tree that hasn't been cut off but is starting to die to grow if the sap is the problem. We need new sap. You must be born again. That's the first thing we see. Do everything under the example of Jesus. Secondly, we see do everything in the authority of Jesus. Matthew 28, 18. Great commission, familiar text. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is our mission commanded by Jesus himself. He said, I've been given all authority, so go in that authority and trust that I will be with you. And when we submit to that authority humbly, everything changes. Our confidence is in his name. And our confidence comes from our humility as we come under his authority. The humility, our humility, is what makes us a channel for his power. That's the qualification. You don't need to be great. You need to be humble. You need to look to him first. You need to count your name as less and count his name as everything and come humbly under his authority. Martin Luther, one of the church, uh, one of the great fathers of the of the church, the father of the Reformation, was alive in the 1500s and he was especially protesting the traditions that were teaching, that the church was teaching justification by works, that we can earn favor with God. Martin Luther said, no, that's not what I see in scripture. I see a justification by faith and grace alone in Christ alone. Alone, And so he came and people started to hear his teaching and started to really get on board with it. And this revival started to happen and they started to name everyone that followed him. They started to nickname everyone that followed him Lutherans. Of course, we know today the Lutheran church is named after Martin Luther. 
I want to read really quickly what Martin Luther said about all that. Because he didn't like all that too much. Listen to his words from a long time ago. I desire, this is Martin Luther speaking, I desire above all things that my name should be concealed and that none be called by the name of Lutheran, but of Christian. What is Luther, he says? My doctrine is not mine, but Christ's. I was not crucified for any. I am but a filthy, stinking bag of worms. That's what he said about himself. <laughs> it's not good positive self-talk, you know, in the age of psychology. I am but a filthy, stinking bag of worms. How is it that any of the sons of God should be denominated from my name? Away with these divisive names. Let us be denominated from Christ from whom alone we have our doctrine. Wouldn't it be great if it were that simple? But the premise is clear, that Martin Luther was submitted under the authority of one name. He said, I wish my name was concealed. It's not about me, this is not my doctrine. Do you remember? I wasn't crucified for you. Christ was crucified for you. And constantly, he's pulling himself back and he's pushing Jesus forward. This is that humility. And this is where we see God's power working through humble vessels. Look at Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. We see this story of seven sons of a priest named Sceva. And they had it all the way backwards. So I want to I read this really quickly here, this story from Acts 19. I think it'll be on the screen, yeah. Verse 11, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Like even the man's apron, you know, who most of y'all would have been making fun of. Even the man's handkerchief, was healing people. Why? Man, Paul must have been a holy dude. Or maybe God is so powerful that he can even use a handkerchief that is lifeless and worthless without his power. But the, the people were getting that twisted the same way that we probably get it twisted sometimes. Verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke, invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. That would be like me saying, Bless you in the name of that guy that Brian Hall's been talking about every Sunday. <laughs> Not very powerful, is it? They were trying to conjure up something because they've heard this work. And they've seen it work. They want a little piece of the action. Ah, get out of there. Evil spirit by the name that Paul proclaimed. Seven, verse 14, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But look at what happened. The evil spirit answered them. This is what the evil spirit said. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize. But who are you? What, what was that that you were saying? And why should I come out again? Because you heard Paul say it? Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It just gets worse and worse and worse for my guys, the seven sons of Sceva. You imagine? Don't imagine. <laughs> uh. 
That's what they tell you to do when they get nervous, you know? Just imagine they're all naked. Like, why? Why would I do that? That doesn't help me. It makes me more nervous. So the seven sons of Sceva, they thought they were going to do it. They're going to, they were going to invoke the name of Jesus and conjure up some, some healing, some deliverance, because that's what Paul did. And they ended up running out of the house naked and wounded, overpowered by the evil spirit himself. There's no authority in your name. There's no authority in even your lip service. Oh, but the, the handkerchief worked. The apron worked. Let me get a little piece of that. No, no, no. You're missing it. Sons of Sceva. You're about to be naked. And then we're going to see how powerful you are, you know. No, it's not the handkerchief. It's not the apron. It's not even the stuff coming out of your mouth. It's what you possess in your heart by faith. It's the power that's flowing through the channel. But if the channel's not connected to the source, there's not going to be power coming through by faith. So you can talk all you want about what other people have been talking about, but it's only going to be lip service at the end of the day if you're not connected to the source. His name the name of Jesus is not a magic word. It's not something we put at the end of our prayers in hopes that it'll reach through the clouds. Please and thank you are the magic word. That's what's in my head right now. Like, Jesus' name, not a magic word. I don't know why I do the things that I do. <laughs> Third point. Let's go to number three. Do everything under the example of Jesus, number one. Do everything in the authority of Jesus, number two. And do everything in the power of Jesus, number three. There is power in the name of Jesus. Some of you who grew up in church know that because you sang it a lot. But you're confused why I'm saying power and not power. What is that word you're saying? There is power in the name of Jesus. We should be carriers of that power. We should be conduits of that power. We should be channels of that power. But we have to be connected to the source. It's like the other day on my, on my cell phone, I, I plugged it in, went to sleep, woke up the next morning. It's got 7% battery. Whoa. It was plugged in. And then my whole day's ruined because I can't go anywhere without my phone. You know, that's how, that's how powerful I am. And come to find out it's not plugged into the wall. And I'm convinced that it's getting power. But it's not in the source. Oh, but I did what I'm supposed to do. I plugged it in. Oh, but I wore what I was supposed to wear and I came on the certain days. And I, I actually came every week for the whole year to church. Like I, I did what I'm supposed to do. I, I, I talked about the same thing and I, I prayed out loud in the same way that, that Brian Hall prayed. But I, but I was never plugged into the source. I was never plugged in to the only source. Remember the words of Jesus, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. Dress it up. All you want. Be the most beautiful 12 foot Christmas tree in any living room known to man. If there's no source of life and the tree is real, it's going to die. There was a lame man, which means he couldn't walk, that we find in Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4. He was lame for his whole life. He, he was born unable to walk. So for 40 years of his life, he was grounded, literally. He couldn't, he couldn't walk. And we see that Peter and John came in contact with him at the temple gate. They were going 
to the temple to pray, and they saw this man who was there every day asking for charity. Every day. 40 years. And the man asked Peter and John if they could help him. And I want you to look at Acts chapter 3, verse 6, and it'll be on the screen. When the man asked Peter if he could help him, Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. What I do have, I give to you. What I do have, I give to you. Don't focus, don't use this as an excuse to not give money. Just a quick side note. Focus on what he's saying. What I do have... What I do possess, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately, this man who couldn't walk his whole life for 40 years with all kind of atrophy, immediately, his feet and ankles were made strong. Not only that, the Bible tells us that he leaped He leapt up and stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. I'm not going to make a fool of myself up here. You know, I already have a little bit, but I mean, you're skipping into the temple. Everybody's like, "Mm." he's like, "Woo!" And they're like, oh, isn't that the guy that was on on the stoop? For like 40 years. What was his name again? Woo! Hey, man, what's your name? Praise God! Hey, hey, what was your name again? God, praise God! In the name of Jesus, I can walk. In the name of Jesus, I can walk and run and skip. What was your name again? Look at God. Peter said, what I have, I give to you. What I possess, I give to you. What is inside of me, I can give to you. There is faith to unlock this power that's inside of me by the Holy Spirit. And I give that to you. You don't need silver and gold. Maybe there are days where you do, but I'm telling you today is the day for your deliverance. Today is the day for your healing. And so what I have, Peter said, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And my man that is unnamed because it doesn't matter was skipping into the temple. And so, verse 11, while, while the man clung to Peter and John, like, do you believe what just happened to me? All the people were utterly astounded, and they ran together it, to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he saw an opportunity to address them and to share the good news. And watch what he said. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power we have made him walk? Don't look at me. Don't name the church after me. As if it was my power. But the the God of Abraham, he continues, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the God of our forefathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. Now he's starting to cut with the knife a little bit. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you in his place. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. And to this, we are witnesses. And in his name, by faith in his name, he has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. In the name of the one that you crucified, Yeah. <laughs> 
So the rulers and the authorities, they saw the commotion and they began to get angry. And so they arrested Peter and John because they healed a man. You know, naturally that's what happens. It's, that's not going to work. So we're going to arrest you and put you into prison. There's too much commotion, too much hysteria going on here. And then in Acts chapter 4, we have this scene where, where Peter and John are in the middle of all of the authorities and the rulers and the high priests. The, the whole high priestly family is there to intimidate Peter and John, to question them and to see if they will still stand on what they said before. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those, look at this, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Revival. 5,000 men. Remember how they used to count back then. When Jesus fed the 5,000 on the hillside and they only counted the men, but there were probably 9,000 plus people actually there that he fed. How many more were saved on this day? than 5,000 men. And just think about this for a second. Peter didn't have a microphone. It's a big crowd. Like there wasn't 12 people gathered around hearing this message of Jesus and being saved. 5,000? I can't even keep three kids quiet to listen to my direction. And Peter's like, men of Israel. You know, back in the day when they didn't have microphones in the church and they had big crowds and they were preaching outside, they used to measure. First thing they do, measure your chest as a preacher to see how big it was to see if you could really project, you know. I mean, I'm out. <laughs> like, my calling would have been different in the 1800s. Peter's preaching. And over 5,000 come to faith in Jesus and look at what happened with the rulers, the elders, the scribes are gathered together. Verse 5, with, An with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. They're gathering around, and they put Peter and John in the middle of them, and they, they ask them this question as they were trying to intimidate them. Look at the question they asked in verse 7. By what power or by what name did you do this? Wrong question. <laughs> Wrong question. They thought they had him. They, had, they thought they had him dead to rights. They thought they had him intimidated enough to not be able to stand boldly. They thought they had them in a place where they were going to wither under the pressure and not proclaim the name of Jesus. Maybe they'll come out with, well, well, it, it, Paul talked about him. No. By what name? By what power? Or by what name did you do this? And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, I give you what I have. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you who were supposed to be the builders, which has now become the cornerstone of all that we believe. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This was his message. In this intimidating scene where the rulers and the authorities were trying to show off their strength and oppose what was happening. 
we can't miss the fact that opposition has never slowed the, slowed, slowed, oh my gosh. We're gonna try that again. Ready? We can't miss the fact that opposition has never slowed the church down. Not once. 5,000 people came to faith in Jesus that day. In the name of Jesus, there is no amount of opposition that can come against that name. In fact, it only revs the engine harder. And that's what we're seeing here. That nothing can stop the church when we're acting in the power of Jesus. When we're giving what has been given to us and we're believing in faith that he is powerful enough to do it again. And when we remove our name and we put his name in the highest place, we do everything in the power of Jesus. Fourth and final point. We do everything for the glory of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. You know this well. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Do it all to the glory of God. Doing all things in the name of Jesus is to do all things for the glory of God. John Piper says it really well. He says, the reason you should do everything for the glory of God is because God does everything for the glory of God. Reason enough. In John chapter 12, Jesus was speaking to some of his disciples and a crowd started to gather around and he was telling them that the time was drawing near for him to be glorified. And so everybody's wanting to hear, wanting to listen. And this is what he said in John 12, verse 27. Now my soul is troubled. Man, there's a whole sermon in that right there. But now my soul is troubled. So what what shall I say? Should I say, Father, save me from this hour? Should I ask for him to save me? But, but wait, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. So, Father, look at verse 28. Glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Can you imagine the people were shaking it. It came down like thunder. I have glorified. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try that, but I've glorified it and I will glorify it again. I will, I will glorify it again. We are to do everything for the glory of Jesus. Here's what I want you to hear. Jesus will not be made into a private influence. Jesus is not to be placed on the shelf of your life to be gone to when things are going bad or when you think you need him. He will not be placed in addition to the rest. He is not a private influence in our life. He is to be made known to the nations. And he's not afraid to use an apron and a handkerchief to prove his glory if you're not willing. The Bible says even the rocks will cry out in our place. He will not be made a private influence for long. And I know we're celebrating America today, but I'm just telling you, he will not be made a private influence for long. He needs to be on our lips. He needs to be being made known through our lives and through our words, whether in word or deed, do all for the glory of Jesus. And wear the shirt, wear the bracelet, but... Let it be coming as a result of a transformed heart. Don't expect it to be enough. Don't expect a shirt to be enough. He will not be made a private influence. He is a pervasive 
reality and he has transformed our identity. It's more than the surface. It's everything from the inside out. Our blood is different. The source of life is different. Do you live that way? May our song be the same as David's in Psalm 115 when he said, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. Not to us, not to me, not to this place, not to any event, not to any movement, not to any anything, name it. It doesn't, it, it pales in comparison. Not to us, but to your name. Be the glory. Because for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, Make no mistake in this place. Jesus exists to be made known. He exists to praise. And so we will not shy away from that. And not only will we not shy away from it, but that will be our primary responsibility to make him known. And if we don't do it, the handkerchief and the rocks will do it for us. So we decide today to join in with all creation and say, he alone is worthy of my life and my praise and everything that comes out of me. His name and his fame go hand in hand. So we, we must remember, we must remember the words of Paul. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him by his example, in his power and authority, and for his glory. That's what Paul is teaching us today. But don't get it twisted. It is very practical and applicable, but don't get it twisted. It's not a surface level application. It's not a do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that for the sake of earning or for the sake of being better. We can't grow if there's no life source. The Christmas tree doesn't grow. The Christmas tree doesn't respond. We wanna be more like the peach tree. No action in his name will be effective without intimacy with him. No action in his name will be effective without connection to the source of life. And Jesus said some of the most challenging, if not the most challenging words in all of the Bible. There will come a day where there will be people that have said, Lord, Lord. And they've even done miraculous signs and wonders. But they're going to come to the end and I'm going to see them and I'm going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Jesus is saying what matters the most in the end and in the now is knowing me. Being in relationship with me, being connected to the life source. I, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full, but they got to connect. They have to enter into relationship. You have to walk with him. You have to be changed from the inside out. This starts with being born again. So have you been crucified with him? That's where we started today when Paul was talking about he was talking to the Christian when he said, you have been crucified with him. Have you? Do you know what happened when you were crucified with Christ? When you turned from your wickedness and your sin and your rebellion and you turned to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, do you know what happened? Those sins were crucified there and they were left in the grave that Jesus is no longer occupying. So walk in the light as children of the light and leave those things behind. Crucified, buried, and now resurrected to new life in him. Is this your story? Is this our story? 
Nothing brings more glory to the Son of God. Don't get it twisted. There is no greater miracle than death to life. So is your story, ah, I've got all of these ornaments on my tree from perfect attendance at Awana or Royal Ambassadors or wherever church you're from. Is that your story? Or is your story, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, Jared, can we get a little more? Can you help me with my marriage? That helps you with your marriage. That's the lead story. That's the whole story. That's the most glorifying story when we tell it. But is that your story? Paul summarized it in Colossians 3, 1 through 3. This is where we started the day. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For those that are in Christ, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees his righteousness. That's what it means to be hidden with Christ in God. Is that your story? If you're coming in here today with a ledger to prove your worthiness, lay it down at the altar and repent. Because no ledger is enough to save. No amount of good deeds is enough to save. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything to the glory of Jesus. Do everything in the name of Jesus. That has to be the way that we respond to the inner reality of our crucifixion and our resurrection with him as a new creation. In Jesus' name. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is an exclusive reality that I and no one else here wants you to miss out on today. So if that's not your story, I, I wanna urge you to come and make it your story today. If the Spirit is drawing you, Don't turn away from what he's leading, the direction he's leading you.